Hey, Sarah, welcome to the Miracles Happen Fertility Podcast. Hi, Dr. Maria. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to speak with you again. I got to be on your lovely podcast the other day, or yeah, you published the other day. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. we will link up to your podcast, of course, for listeners slash washer, watchers of this episode. But you have some fascinating stuff to talk about that I cannot wait to dive into. Um, first, I'd love to hear about uh, who you are and what, what you do for a living. Sure. So my name is Sarah Willoughby. I live in the beautiful Melbourne in Australia. I am originally from the UK, so I have a bit of a funny accent going on that confuses people. And I <laughs> work here as a transformation coach, infertility coach, author, speaker, and energy healer. And I have three beautiful children who are 17, 12, and 8. Oh, my goodness. That's a lot of children. <laughs> I was like maxed out it too. <laughs> they certainly keep me very busy because they're at all different ages and stages. It's quite interesting. You know, we're doing tea parties and we're doing driving lessons. So yes. Oh, yeah, you're on your toes. <laughs> Absolutely. So I would love to hear about your fertility journey specifically because you've written a glorious book. The title is, I like to use the word provocative because it's like, wait, what? <laughs> so do you have a copy with you? I do. I will show you. I would love for you to show. Perfect. For folks who are watching on YouTube, you can see this in Fertility Saved My Life, Sarah Willoughby. And uh, I just spoke it for those who are listening. Of course, we're going to link up to everything on the show notes, but listen to that title, Infertility Saved My Life. Whoa. Amazing title. So <laughs> I'd love for you to jump right in, Sarah. What What is the story? How did it begin and how did it save your life? Okay. So my journey started with being diagnosed with PCOS when I was 25, but I'd had issues, you know, the normal period issues since I was 12 and I'd gone on the pill when I was about 14 so let's put a band-aid over it ignore it and don't worry yep. about it till you want to have a family so I was always aware that I might struggle to have a family and was very surprised when I actually fell pregnant straight away with my son so my son was pretty much conceived on my honeymoon and he then decided that he wanted to enter the world very quickly and came two months prem so I went on that journey of, of dealing with, you know, giving birth, not knowing what I was doing. I hadn't had my, my antenatal classes. That was quite a traumatic experience. And he was in mm -hmm. intensive care for, for quite a while, not being able to take my baby home. So that's another sort of part of the story that I want to highlight that we don't talk about is, um, is when you go through that journey. And I was very fortunate that I got to take my son home, but not everybody does. And I'm very grateful for the lessons that I learned in that experience, very humbled. Mm -hmm. Because it had happened so quickly with my son, I was just very naive and I thought, well, great, I can plan to the, to the month when I wanna have my next one. And it just didn't happen like that. So I went on this really crazy journey through secondary infertility, which a lot of people don't necessarily know about. I didn't really know that it was a thing and I didn't know anybody that had been through it. You hear of people struggling to have their first child, but not necessarily their second or third subsequent you know, child. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was failing. I felt like I was working in the corporate world. I'd spent six years at university. I'd worked my way up the corporate ladder. And I was under a lot of stress at the time. But this was one of the first things that I hadn't achieved, achieved in inverted commas in and, mm -hmm. and considered myself to be failing in and I was really not in control of this I, I don't believe that we're in control of anything in life you know that's my belief now but I wasn't even in charge of it that's how I felt um so I after about two years fell pregnant and I was so excited and I planned that baby you know and I'd move my mentally move my son out of his room and move the baby in there and he'd moved into the bigger room and you know started doing all the things and then I had a missed miscarriage which again I didn't even know what a missed miscarriage was and I just remember sitting in the room with the nurse and having walked past this 
line of people all waiting to have their scans. Some of them would also be given bad news. Some of them would also be told that everything was okay and her drawing the curtain across the, the window in the door and just saying, I'm really sorry uh, and explaining it all to me. And, and then oh. within a few minutes, within a few minutes, what do you want to do about it? Do you want to have a natural miscarriage or do you want to come into hospital and have a DNC? And I hated hospitals. I was terrified. I'd had a bit of a traumatic experience when I was very, very young that had, I don't think I've even really appreciated until the last couple of years that that was trauma for me. And so even just the thought of going into a hospital to have my baby was really traumatic for me. So the thought of going in for something that you didn't want to do was really not appealing. But when she explained to me that the baby was going to still keep growing and I would still feel pregnant, all the hormones would be released and they would not know how long this would continue for. I just wanted my baby out. I was like, okay. So fortunately I was able to go in quite quickly. And I just remember lying in this ward with lots of young girls who were going in to have abortions and feeling like God, spirit, Buddha, who, you know, whatever your belief system is, had put the wrong baby in the wrong body. There was no judgment from me. You know, they're at a different stage in life, but just feeling like how cruel, you know, like I'm I'm here, they're there. It, it was just very bizarre and that wasn't the first time, um, the only time, sorry, that I experienced that. When I came out from the uh, general anaesthetic, I just felt so lost. I just felt like this is cruel. I'm right back at the beginning of my journey to try and have another baby and I don't know whether it will happen. And I went through a lot of grief with that, unfortunately connected with the hospital chaplain who actually organised a funeral service for me. And that was something that totally helped my healing process. My and it's some, yeah, something that I would really highly recommend that you, there is some form of ritual um, to say goodbye. And, and they actually did a proper funeral service. They had the tiniest, tiniest coffin with baby Willoughby on a plaque on the top, which my husband, you know, walked down the, the aisle in the, in the chapel with. Um, they'd put together this little brochure and it was just me and my husband and, and my son. And I felt very, very blessed, very, very blessed that somebody, the, I think the only person that recognised that I'd seen that as my baby, um, that actually honoured honored that part of that journey yes. for me. It's yeah. amazing. I have not heard of that. And I wish that more people would have that experience because yeah. it is so I mean, huge. It really is. It really is. And that is, yeah, even if you just do something by yourself, even if you, you know, go and plant a tree in your garden, write a poem, share some stories, you know, just, just really do honor that part of, of your journey. I think it helps you to, to move forward with a bit more ease and grace for sure. And then There's something my... also about, oh, I'm sorry. No, you carry on. There is something about somebody else acknowledging that this life is now gone. Because, yeah. yes, of course, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing to create ritual for yourself. But to have somebody else say, we need to do this for this soul is so yeah. amazing. I, I congratulate that chaplain. Oh, fabulous. Yes, and I acknowledge her in my book because I don't think she knows how much she helped me to heal. I have such gratitude for her and I really hope that the next time I go back to the UK that I can actually find her and say thank you mm -hmm. and give her a copy of my book because it really was a profound healing experience and just having, like you said, having that validation from somebody else that your baby mattered, that they've been acknowledged in some way was was really helpful incredible so from there I just went through this crazy journey through secondary infertility of nothing working trying you know lots of different drugs and nothing working and feeling like all the months were ticking by and I'd wanted to have four children and I'd wanted to have them very close together in age so I could go back to my corporate career at that point and it just wasn't happening for me Eventually, I got referred to the fertility clinic, except I didn't. They ended up referring me to the gynecology 
department and I lost about a year in that process and was given a lot of bad medical advice and treatment and things that if I had fallen pregnant would have just led to me miscarrying again. And eventually I got put in front of the right person and um, got referred to the clinic that I needed to be in, but there was another waiting list for that, even though they'd messed my care up and I should have been there sooner. So we made the decision at that point when we were told really IVF was our only option to go over to Norway to have IVF treatment, you know, make a holiday of it, take the stress out of it. Yeah, it was it was anything but that. It was an IVF cycle that went disastrously wrong and led to me lying in intensive care thinking, what have I done? What have I done? How did you land up in intensive care? So I ended up with not just overstimulation, but hyperstimulation. So my body just reacted really badly to the drugs and everything just started to shut down and there was nothing that the doctors could do to stop my deterioration. They could just treat each symptom as it arose and hope that I didn't die in the process. So it was very, wow. very confronting. It was confronting emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. It was the most painful journey that I've ever experienced from a physical pain perspective. I wouldn't wish that level of pain on anybody. And the only thing that really got me through it was this deep knowing that I had to be okay for my son. And so I'm very, very grateful that I had him in my life, but also it was just this belief that there's something more here. This can't, this can't be how it ends. I haven't even begun my life really, you know, like, so in terms of the physical symptoms, my, my kidneys stopped working. I put on about 20 kilograms of fluid. I was at risk of blood clots. I, I had fluid on my lungs. Um, couldn't breathe, you know, just felt like I was drowning. And then the hardest part was when they said, right, we're going to take you for a, um, a scan and check your heart because I was at risk of heart failure. And I was just like, oh, no, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm going to be mentally strong enough to cope with this if they give me bad news. Fortunately, that was all clear. And eventually the process does reverse itself and your body naturally starts to heal. And once you start to lose all the fluid, then the pain starts to subside and, and, you know, fortunately for me, I was okay and I recovered, but I had this really important moment where I did a deal with the universe and I was like, okay, I'll do you a deal. If you give me a second chance at life, I will spend the rest of my life being of service. I will walk towards everything that has scared me. I will try to be my best version and help other people to do the same. And I'm really proud that I've done that. And it's been an amazing journey of self-discovery and acceptance and self-love and I didn't realize that at the time oh gosh how profound so in a way infertility is created or it created life-threatening literally life-threatening scenario for you yes and yeah. and you developed meaning you develop meaning from that. I had to. It's incredible. I was, I was like, I've got a choice here. I knew it was. Um, it became a mental battle, and I know fundamentally that if I hadn't have learned meditation, which I'd done a couple of years prior to try and help me with the stress of infertility, I wouldn't be here. If I hadn't have listened to those meditation CDs every time they did a painful process or procedure on me, if I hadn't have been able to get out of my mind and all the repetitive, negative, you know, self-deprecating thoughts, the guilt, the shame. I I know I wouldn't be here. And, and watching my son, my son returned home to the UK with his mother-in-law and I couldn't even hug him goodbye. I was in too much pain. And I just watched him walk out of the hospital doors and he just turned around and looked at me and smiled. And I didn't know whether I'd ever see him again. I had, I had to make meaning from this because I was going through this guilt of, what happens if I've done this elective procedure and now my son grows up without his mom? Like, yeah, it was, but I am very, very grateful for that. And 
I'd mentioned that it wasn't the only time previously that I'd been on an abortion ward. Actually, when I started to recover, they put me in a room and that became the abortion ward again. So Mm -hmm. every day I faced, you know, lots of girls coming in and, you know, taking the tablet and then bleeding everywhere and then leaving. And they wouldn't clean the bathrooms until the next day. And then the next process, you know, the same thing, same thing. So every time I'd go into the bathroom, it was just, there was just blood everywhere. It was things like that, that I don't think I realized how traumatic that was for me until I actually started to write my story and, and share what happened. Yeah. But it didn't, it didn't stop there because I had had, so I'd had my egg retrieval done before I overstimulated and hyperstimulated. So I had 10 frozen embryos. And once I finally recovered, they'd said, come back to Norway and, and have a frozen embryo transfer. And there were no, there was no risk to me. I'd been to already been told you can never go through IVF again because it will kill you. And so my journey had sort of come to an end in that respect, but I have this hope that, you know, hope lay in the freezer and went back to, to Norway. I went through a lot of hypnotherapy to make sure that I didn't carry the trauma of, of what had happened when I was there. So lots of, you know, watching the images play out in my mind over and over again until I got bored so that I wasn't triggered. And I went back and the, the um, transfer was very successful and I got pregnant with twins. And oh, wow. I was like, wow, this is what happened this way. I always had this romantic notion about what it must be like to have twins. You know, a lot of people with <laughs> twins would probably be like, you're crazy. But I'd always wanted twins and I thought they don't run in my family. This was how it was meant to be. But I ended up having another missed miscarriage. So I lost one and then I lost the other one. Mm. And oh, my. And then oh I my. surrendered. At that point, I surrendered and I said, okay, do with me what you will. And during that process, we were emig- you know, trying to emigrate over to Australia because I was like, I, I really wanted to come, but I'd allowed fear to sort of stop me from being 100% certain that it was what I wanted to do. So we just quickened up that process. And just before uh, we emigrated was when I lost the twins. We were coming out as a family of five and then came out as a family mm-hmm. of three. And within six weeks of being in Australia, I fell pregnant with my daughter, who is now 12. Oh, naturally. Yes. Yep. Wow. What do you attribute that to? Surrendering. Just for the first time in my life, I felt, I felt peaceful. I remember lying on my bed thinking, I've come home, number one, and don't ever let me forget this moment. When I go through challenge in the future, bring me back to this feeling, this moment that I know that I'm so powerful and unstoppable that anything is possible when you get out of your own way. And I fell pregnant, not really trying, not having a regular cycle, not even knowing whether I was ovulating. Like it literally felt like a miracle to me. And and then four years later, I had my my other little girl. So I am very, very grateful for the journey. It has become my biggest blessing. My children are my greatest teachers, my biggest blessings. And that's why I share my story to just provide hope and inspiration to other people that you never know what the universe has in store for you. You just never know. You don't. And it is a miracle. It's, it's, they're both miracles, you know, it's because of your willingness and ability to surrender. And I'd love to dive deeper into that because, you know, it's one of the themes that I talk about quite a bit as well. And yet people are like, well, how the frick do I do that? How do I surrender? Yes. And I'm wondering about that. How, how did you physically, practically surrender? What did that look like for you? Meditation was the, the key. For me, meditation had already mm-hmm. started to change my life. It had enabled me to start to have those moments of quiet and stillness where I could hear my own voice, where I realized that all the answers to every problem lay inside. And the more I practiced that, the more connected I felt, the more I went on a spiritual journey, the more my intuition heightened, the more I was led from my heart, not my head. And mm-hmm. so that layer of stress just 
just started to peel away and I was able to see things in a completely different way from a completely different perspective and realize that my work was not done and I had a big reason to be here and I was really going to make the most of that but it was it's a daily practice it is a daily practice and some days I sit down to do meditation and it's it's terrible you know, and you mm -hmm. can't get out of your head and the, the monkey chatter is going on and you're just like, Argh! and other days <laughs> it's the most blissful, beautiful experience. Yeah. And and so it's just keep trying just for two minutes every day. Just focus yeah. on your breath. Just close your eyes. Just be still. And you'll start to connect yeah. yourself. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's interesting because, um, I think we talked about this and when you interviewed me that I, I started doing meditation because I wanted to prove it wrong, right? Like this is yes. stupid. It's not going to be helpful. Nothing's going to help me, but I've tried everything. So I'm just going to try this, try this. And then there was that one moment that was like, oh, I just touched on bliss. And then yes. the whole process began about wanting to touch on bliss again. And mm -hmm. you're right. It's far and few in between. And some days I'm like, yes picking the airpods out throwing them. this is stupid <laughs> and back to this is stupid but i know it's not it it mm -hmm. is the i'm like you it's the most important tool um that i used and so wow i just want to let that story settle for a moment because i don't know obviously there's a lot more detail and a lot more um uh, you know profundity in your story in your book but even you saying what happened i'm getting tearful over here thinking oh my oh my goodness just it, the transformation that you created for yourself and you're a transformational coach right and so i am i never went back to the corporate world yeah. i was just yeah i was, i learned reiki i started yeah. writing and speaking and and coaching, which was a natural progression from what I'd done in the corporate world. So I'd worked and coached managers for, for sort of 10 years. But uh -huh. I I love, I love, I love being able to get to the root cause of people's issues and not just put a band-aid over it and move that person on. I really like the yes. journey that I'm on now where I can help people to see themselves for the first time and to go on that journey to self-love. And to see themselves how I see them as a soul, you know, when they walk into my studio and I connect with them and I just see how beautiful they are, when they can look in their own eyes and feel that beauty for themselves for the first yes. time, what a gift. What a gift. It's incredible. You know, it, it seems like that's something that's so simple or it's on a it's on an affirmation card or something, but it's really ineffable. You can't really describe with words what that moment is like right and so, so right. what what can, huh, what can people expect when they when they work with you do you do you do so you have a few titles you mentioned right so like author and speaker and um a transformational coach fertility coach infertility coach you say and uh reiki reiki are you reiki yes. master yeah. reiki practitioner yeah reiki practitioner and so do you incorporate all of these titles into your work with clients? What does that look like? I do. So every person that I work with, the sessions are different because I, they're intuitively guided. So you might, you, you have a structure around the things that you know work and the, the ways that you can help people to find what's blocking them and heal and move forward. But I'm always intuitively guided and sometimes we might uncover something and then we need to go really deep into that and we'll find something from childhood that the person didn't even remember or know about. So I love the fact that I can incorporate everything into it. So yeah, one session we might purely do Reiki and energy healing. Another session we might focus more on meditation. We do exercises. We really start to connect deeply with self and learn how to do that for ourselves because I want to empower people to be able to do it in the same way that you empower people to connect with spirit babies. I empower people to be able to, to connect to their own intuition and be able to move forward rather than relying on other people for that validation and guidance, and uh, which is great to do that. And we all need to do that. And I do that. And I know you do that. But 
it's really nice to be able to do it for self because we are the most powerful version of us when we're deeply connected and we can follow our own guidance. So it is a beautiful process. It's, I always laugh, I say to my clients, you know, I've got a box of tissues. You're very, it's a very safe space to cry and release. And um, just, yeah, just creating time and space for self and just honoring who you are and trying to understand, trying to connect back with joy. That's something else that I love doing because life is very serious. And I think we forget that we're supposed to, you know, we deserve to feel joy. What does joy look like? When was the last time you felt joyful? What were you doing? How old were you? What, you know, is this something creatively that you used to do that you stopped doing because you think you don't have time for it? So we delve into all of that as well. Um, because when we're being creative, that's when we can really connect with ourselves because we lose ourselves in that creativity. If you're painting a picture or even just weeding the garden, you know, something that helps you to get out of your head, helps you to connect. Yeah, that's actually a, an example I was going to mention because joy doesn't have to be this, you know, big, I painted a mural on the side of a building. It doesn't need yeah. to be that. It was one of the memories that I wrote about in my book was, when I touched on joy again, it was sitting in on my back patio and smelling the lavender there and watching the bees kind of bob around the lavender. Yeah. And I went, Oh my God, this feels so good. This yeah. feels so good. And smelling the the certain smell that tomato plant leaves have, you know, that you know, oh, pungent, yes. it's, yeah. you know, that smell. And I'm like, ah, oh, that. So really being, that's where the mindfulness meditation practice comes into, like just really being, finding beauty in everything yes. and smiling yeah. about it. And, and that connection to nature is so important to me. That was another thing aside from meditation that's changed my life. Being outdoors, connecting with nature, going for a walk, taking socks and shoes off, grounding. I take my clients to the beach and we do a releasing session at the beach. So we let go of all the old, we welcome in the new, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's the, the oh. sound of the ocean, the smell of the ocean, the sand between your toes. You know, if you can do it at sunrise or sunset, it's just amazing because the energy is just oh. so so peaceful and so powerful and yeah I love I love experiencing that with my clients I'm very blessed to live close to lots of beautiful beaches and be able to do that yes. but it works works just as well online you know you can create that energetic space for somebody and, uh, yeah. and go through that releasing process yeah there's something about the beach you're right it's like the earth is there, water is there, the sky is there. It's all the elements, right? Air, yeah. wind. One of the um, analogies that I've used, it's a true story, but it's about surrender, which is what I wanted to talk about in depth with you is how you teach folks surrender. Um, I was, I grew up near a beach and we would um, go there often. And one time I got stuck in uh, a loop where there was a dip in the sand and I couldn't get to the next part of the earth to be above the water. And I was just churning and trying to, you know, frantically get out of the water. And um, I decided to surrender. I decided to mm -hmm. let go. And of mm -hmm. course, salt water buoys the body up. And so it buoyed my body up and I, and I, the waves just pushed me down the shoreline and eventually I ended up on land again. And it was scary. It's terrifying yeah. to let go. Yeah. I think that that's one of the things that, um, folks who ask about surrender are like, well, how do you do it? But I don't want to, cause that's scary, but how do you do it? No, I don't want, no. <laughs> so yeah. How do you, how do you help people over that hump? Think of letting go of surrendering. Of I think it's about walking alongside somebody and creating that safe space for them to fall knowing that it is a journey it is a process it's not something that you're gonna get right every single time and I still don't get it right I have to surrender at least you know probably once a day in some capacity for me it is about coming back to my breath it is just about creating those moments of stillness and then increasing the length of time that you feel that because 
when you are able to be not do that's when you create that shift between you know what's possible and what's not you really start to realize that the only space that matters is right now it's the only place that you can make change so if I can encourage the person I'm working with to just just give me you all of you just for this hour or however long we're working together just be with me here right now you might not feel these shifts until the next time you look at a problem and you actually respond to it differently and then you'll go ah I would normally have responded in this way but now I'm responding here even just starting to create more space between an event a situation something stressful and how you respond to it means that energetically that will change means that you will start to learn to be able to surrender knowing that you are not the energy of the thing that you're facing you have the ability to be able to take yourself away from it and look at it as an observer and once we learn how to master that that's when life truly changes and we all have moments of dipping in and out of that absolutely if I'd perfected the art of that I would be in a very different space in my life but you know it is just that commitment it's that commitment to self that daily commitment to keep trying every single day yeah. and just to realize that every day is a fresh start is a fresh opportunity to be your best version to create the life of your dreams you know to co-create with the universe the life of your dreams mm -hmm. to ask for help because when we ask for help from the universe, that's when the universe steps in. And as we spoke about on, on our conversation previously, that's when we get all the signs and the synchronicities. When I say get them, that's when we start to see them, feel them, sense them, know them. They're there anyway, but we start to mm -hmm. tune into them. And then we realize that we're not alone. We realize that we have this support system around us and it encourages us to keep trying. And, in, and in, when we fall down, when something hurts, we get back up quicker. We get back up quicker. Yes. Oh my gosh. There's so much that I want to unpack with everything you just said. <laughs> I want to <laughs> come, I want to like culminate or connect it to something that you said in the beginning of today, because it was, you have so much like profound wisdom. You said, I don't believe anything is in our control anyway, but I wasn't even in charge. And what you just described there the whole letting go process and surrendering process actually from what you said sounds like it put them squarely in charge now you're in charge you're in charge of your life now you're yes co-creating with the universe that is you that's you being in charge you're now noticing and now following through with your intuitive guidance your own internal guidance mm -hmm. that is amazing and i wonder what your 12 year old self would have done if she was paying attention to that internal guidance, if she would have been taking the birth control pills or she would have oh. been doing other things. Right? No, she would have actually been no. trying to get a diagnosis because I didn't get my diagnosis till I was 25 and just by chance. Yep. 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 Which is I, yeah. 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 It is crazy. I had endometriosis and was not diagnosed until, you know, in my thirties because of the fertility mm -hmm. stuff. I was just told, Oh, that's normal. And I'm like, yeah. it's normal for me to need to stay home from school because my yeah. my I'm in so much pain. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> yes, it's normal. I know. How many people get told that? Oh, it's really normal yeah. to have really heavy period. I was having periods all the time, really heavy, like cramps, like couldn't stand up. You know, that's no. not a life. That's not a life. I would just, that's you know, true. your body, your body will settle down. Just get on with it. It's just what being a woman is. Really? Right. Right. Yeah, lies. <laughs> exactly. If you listen, if you hear nothing else from this conversation, hear that. Trust your body. Know your body. Keep going and and ask for a second opinion. Do not be afraid to ask for a second opinion. Really, yes. that was or one third of the big, or fourth. Or, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was one of the big lessons I learned on my journey. Was that I gave my power away. I just handed myself yes. over to the medical professionals and said, "Do with me what you will. Just get me a baby." And they went, okay, we'll just keep poking you and prodding you. And we might do a bit of investigation and we might not. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. You're still young. It's P.S. Okay. We, yeah. P.S. We might kill you. Uh, yeah, you exactly. Yeah. If we get it wrong, That's you might awful. end up in intensive care. Yeah. You know, that might happen. 
<laughs> right. Giving your power back. So you're you're teaching folks how to, like you said in the beginning, to um, feel their own power again, which fertility stuff, it, t it does. It takes away one's power because, you know, you thought you were doing the right thing. You know, you have sex with your partner or, you know, and you think that, you know, you're around ovulation, you're doing all the things right or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's still not working. Um, and so you start to question and there's a lot more to that, of course, but power does get taken away. So I'm, I love mm -hmm. that folks working with you get to attain their power, take their power back in such a beautiful yeah. way. Just reclaim so, themselves on that journey as a, we claim themselves as who they are, you know, as Sarah, as Maria, as, as yeah. you know, not just the woman who is infertile, who is struggling to have a baby, but who are you yeah. aside from that? Aside from that infertility right. struggle, who are you? What do you what yeah. do you want in life? And I think it's a really transformative yeah. process. And yeah, I have Indeed. deep gratitude for that. And that's why the book is called Infertility Saved My Life, because it saved me from a life that was lacking resonance. If I hadn't have yes. gone through infertility, I'd have still been in the corporate world doing the same thing that was not bringing me joy, that was stressing me out. But I felt obligated to do it because I'd spent so long studying at university and I I was too scared to explore the the alternatives yes I'm right there with you <laughs> <laughs> right there with you so in effect you you are teaching people how to come back to themselves but a better version like you're Sarah 2.0 clearly right you're, you're exactly you're yeah <laughs> Yeah. And hopefully, ne hopefully next week I'll be two point, you know, two point one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and on and on up that scale, and then eventually I'll talk to Sarah ten point oh, you know. But right, yeah. so coming back to themselves, who they really are, but a, even potentially a better version, mm. uh, which is I'm exactly all, what I'm it sounds loving. like you did. I'm more loving That's right because I realized I didn't, I didn't love myself before I went on this journey. Mm -hmm. I didn't even like myself at times. I hated my body, what all the things it was doing wrong, how it was, you yep. know, deserving me. To actually have deep gratitude for my body, to fall in love with my body, to fall in love with myself for the first time in my life. Something that some people take their whole lives to to figure out or maybe never even get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in effect, fertility coaching becomes whole life coaching just as you you know said transformationally you're you're transforming wow it sounds like you have done absolutely beautiful work and i'm so ah this is weird to say i'm so glad you experienced infertility <laughs> i'm so glad you had to deal with that <laughs> yeah no but i am too but i am yeah. i am too i have the most beautiful relationship with all three of my children that i wouldn't have had if I'd stayed in the corporate yeah. world, I would have been all about, you know, just the, the corporate rat race, not knowing how to get off the hamster yeah. wheel. And I've been yeah. able to watch my children grow up. I've been able to, you know, just, just be their mom and the best version of myself that I can be. Mm -hmm. I don't always get it right. Often don't, but to at least mm -hmm. know what it looks like and feels like when I am and to keep aspiring yeah every day to, to be the best version of myself and to guide them and show them and help them through their journey and hopefully learn the lessons that I learned the hard way when they're still children and teenagers and young adults. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, again, I'm going to tie it back to one of the profound things that you said that it's, it's fascinating that all of this accomplishment comes from being in the stillness rather than doing, 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 doing. Yes. Yes. Because we always Definitely. think that in order to achieve, we have to be doing. But what we know is that we achieve in inverted commas so much more when we are in that space of being. That's when my creativity is incredible, when I'm just, you know, I swim in my pool, I'm looking at the sky, listening to the birds. That's when all my ideas come through. You know, I'm connecting yep. with nature and I'm just, yep. you know, I'm just being. I don't have to sit there at my computer and think, 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 right, what am I going to write my next article about? And, you know, it's a beautiful way of just being in flow in life. Yes. 
You are inspired because you're being in spirit. Being in spirit. Exactly. Thank you so much, Sarah, for all your wisdom. I think I need to go back and listen to everything you said because I'm like, wow, <laughs> what? There's so much said today. All of the links to everything that you have, your website, your book, everything, it will be on the show notes. And uh, I, I can't wait for more folks to find their way to you. Do you also do um, like a, not in like long distance work or is it always in person? Yeah, no, I work online. I predominantly work online, oh, actually. Good. So, oh, yes, good. I can connect good. with people globally and I do distant healings for people as well. So Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so many more people coming to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. I appreciate your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved our conversation and keep doing all the beautiful work that you're doing.